Welcome into another edition of Ask the Experts. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Dave Callender. My guest this hour back from Remax Twin City Realty. It's Canada's top real estate agent, Faisal Susie Walla. Faisal, how are you doing? Fine, thanks, Dave. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm glad to have you on the show. Always learn so much when you're on. And we want to, of course, let people know that if they'd like to learn more, they can go to Faisal's website, which is online at homeshack.com. Or you can call them anytime at 519-624-5555. Uh, Faisal, quickly, for folks who haven't heard you on the show before, tell us a little bit about yourself. So I'm a realtor in the region of Waterloo. I've been practicing real estate for about 34 years. I'm a broker at Remax Twin City Realty. And um, I specialize mostly in residential sales. So that's my... Uh, that's my wheelhouse. And uh, Faisal hasn't, uh, maybe he's being humble. He hasn't mentioned the fact that he's also an author. Uh, he uh, wrote a book as the pandemic set in and it came out that year uh, back in 2000, correct? Uh, 2020, yes, September in of 2020. 2020 in, yeah, sorry, not 2000. That, that would be a long time ago. 2020, the book is called The Real Deal. A uh, billion dollar real estate broker. And that is something that we always talk about when we're on the show. It's available on Amazon as a physical book and, of course, as an audio book as well. So I'm sure we'll come back to that a little later on in the show. As we normally do, we're going to start things off by talking about a, a market update. What have we seen in the market so far this summer? So we're seeing um, a continuation of declines and that's a result of the interest rates rising. We've seen the market steadily go down approximately 10% every time the interest rate has been rising anywhere from half to three quarters of a percent. So to put this into perspective, from March of 2020 to March of 2022, our values were up approximately 62% in that two year period. Now we've seen 30% of that give back. So we're about 30% above pre-pandemic values, but we have seen these highs of 60, 62% since the original um, market, you know, had started uh, with COVID, with the de-urbanization, with people working from home, with people wanting to live in the suburbs. And we've, we've been the beneficiary of those increases. But that was largely based on lower interest rates. And as interest rates started to rise, the value started giving back. And now we're seeing, you know, a modest increase over what we had originally seen. Um, but again, depending on what happens with interest rates, we could see further declines from now. Okay. And uh, how, what are you seeing with, with houses being on the market at the moment? Uh, I mean, there was a time where they were on the market for less than a day. What are you seeing now? Well, we've, we're, we're, we're seeing days on market somewhere around, you know, 20 to 30 days. So we're not, we're not accustomed to that in the last three years. You know, you put up a for sale sign, you have multiple offers coming at you almost immediately. So now there's a little bit more of a thoughtful process in behind offers that are coming in. Essentially, we're seeing conditions come back. So the home may sell in a week or 10 days, but then there's another week left where one has to get their financing in order, inspections have to be done, and we're seeing conditional offers on the sale of the buyer's property, which could take 30 to 45 days to happen. So the conditions are back, and that's not a bad thing because it's giving people the opportunity to pause, put some thought behind their decision, make sure that they have their ducks in a row, make sure the financing's in place, because we've seen a lot of horror stories right now with deals not closing as a result of appraisals not coming in at the valuations that people paid for their homes, and they didn't run to the bank the day after they bought their house. They waited two, three, four months, four weeks, and then the values started declining just as the values were increasing weekly, now we're seeing the values decline almost weekly. It's no secret that interest rates have been rising. What is expected as we continue going through uh, 2022? It's expected that, and it's going to be dependent on the key rate. When the Bank of Canada increases their rate on uh, September 7th, that will be the next increase, we could see another decline, anywhere from 5 to 7%. So... My prediction is that 
you know, we could see half to three quarter percent increase by the end of this year, which in turn will have a negative impact on values by up to 10 percent. Now, buyers have been uh, at this point or some of them are saying, I'm going to wait a little while. I know that values have decreased, but I'm going to wait a little while and see if if they go down even more. In your opinion, should buyers be waiting for further declines in values? Okay, so let's look back at January, February, and all of 2020 and all of 2021. Buyers were paying for the opportunity just to buy a home. It didn't matter what the home looked like. They just wanted to participate in the purchase of a home so that they could be in the game and not on the sidelines while the values continue to increase. There was a time that there was between 80 to 100 homes on the market, and there were hundreds of buyers chasing those same 80 to 100 homes. That's why we were getting 10 to 15 offers per home. The shift has occurred now where, as a result of the rising interest rates and people pausing, that they've decided, well, we're going to rent instead. That's driving the rental market up. The problem is this, the value of the home will always match the payment. So when the interest rates started going down, the buyer was able to take the same payment and afford a larger value or a higher value. So I'll give you an example. I had buyers back in March of 2020 that were qualified to buy a $600,000 home. By May, when the rates had declined, um, they were able to afford $800,000 in the same year. So two months later, they could afford to go up to $800,000. That didn't purchase them a better home. They just ended up paying $800,000 for the home that was $600,000 two months ago. So the same thing is happening right now, but the opposite. As the rates increase, one who could have afforded $800,000 with a $3,000 a month payment whatever their down payment may have been, I'm just giving you an example, that same payment must now afford to buy a home at a higher interest rate. Therefore, that $800,000 home is matching the payment by reducing its value to $600,000. The difference is you're not getting a better home or a worse home. You're getting the same home for lower money, but your payment is increasing as a result of the interest rate. All that to say, sitting on the sidelines right now, and waiting for things to get worse is not going to get you a better home. So you might as well jump in to the market, put some thought behind it, do the home inspection, get the appraisal done, make sure your financing is in place. Real estate is a long game. Real estate is not a short term. It's not something that you're buying and flipping daily, especially for those who are looking at entering the market for the first time. So this is a great opportunity for them to enter the market and get the home that they want, not the home that they need to buy as a result of the market going insane and everybody's in a panic to buy. So you don't need to trip over people right now. You can go make a thoughtful decision, buy a home. Obviously there have been decreases across the board, but which price point are you finding has affected the most? The high end has affected the most as a result of just people don't have the consumer confidence, but that's not just as a result of interest rates. The stock market has been you know, very volatile. We're starting to see some recovery right now, but we've, we've also seen other factors affect values. So the lower price points have been affected as a result of yes, interest rates, but also due to fuel costs, gas prices. So when a commuter was coming into Cambridge six, seven, eight months ago at $1.30 a liter, uh, when the rates started hitting $2 a liter or $2.10 a liter, the, the effect of that was six to $700 a month to the average uh, commuter on their fuel costs. So they're saying, hang on, maybe I should live in Brampton or Milton or Mississauga and save the gas costs. Yes, I'll pay $100,000, $150,000 more to live in Brampton, but at least I'm not paying the fuel costs. So that was the transition. Now that we're seeing prices hitting $1.60, $1.65 a liter, that may change a little bit. We're already starting to see the commuters coming back into the marketplace. So the six to $800,000 mark and then the above, above $1.5 million mark have been affected the most in my experience. 
My guest this hour on Ask the Experts, we're speaking with Faisal Suziwala of Remax Twin City Realty, Canada's top real estate broker. Get in touch. Give them a call at 519-624-5555 or learn more online at homeshack.com. Thanks so much for joining us today on Ask the Experts. Back with us from Remax Twin City Realty, it's Canada's top real estate broker. It's Faisal Suziwala online at homeshack.com. And on your phone at 519-624-5555. Faisal, the last time that we talked on the show, uh, we discussed a topic that I haven't seen a reaction to this in a while like this. Just folks around the radio station office talking about this segment, about deals not closing and what happened because of that. Let's talk about that again, and, and how has that been going in the past few months? It has been extremely stressful for both buyers and sellers. And I can say, personally speaking, very stressful for me as a realtor to manage um, what's happening in the market. And fortunately, we're at the tail end of those deals not closing, uh, but there's been a lot of loss there's been a lot of stress. There's unfortunately a lot of lawsuits that are going to occur as a result of what has happened. So let me just sort of summarize what happened. Back in February and March, beginning of March, the market was at an all, all time high. Buyers were coming in with unconditional offers, um, no condition on appraisal, no condition on sale of home, um, financing. You know, it was just, we're going to buy. We're going to give you $300,000 more than you're asking just for the opportunity to buy your home. Now, had that buyer gone to the bank immediately and requested the financing, they probably would have been okay. If that buyer had a home to sell and put that home on the market immediately and sold it within a week, they probably would have been okay. But what happened was many of those buyers bought in February thinking that the market is going to continue increasing March, April, May, June. We're just going to see 5%, 5%, 5% more. So let's let's take a little gamble here. Sell in February, but wait to sell, sorry, buy in February, but wait to sell our home until April. So we'll we'll gain another 10%. But what happened was the interest rate started going up, fuel costs started going up, stock market started going down, Russia and Ukraine happened. So all the negative, and then of course the media got into it, and it just threw a wrench into that entire process. Fast forward two months down the road, the buyer's home is not sold. Now they're taking less money. They're almost giving it away. Banks are sending appraisers out two months after the original purchase. So they're comparing to what's happening now in the market, not what happened two months ago, and saying, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, the home you bought two months ago is now worth 20% less. So yes, we'll give you 80% of your purchase price, or we'll give you 80% of the appraised price, whichever is lower. Obviously, the appraised price is lower. So the buyer who only had 20% to put down now has to find another 20% to put down. Where's that money going to come from? That buyer's agent is now calling me as a listing agent saying, hey, Faisal, we paid 1.2 million. The house only appraised at 1 million. My buyer only had $200,000 to put down. Now we need $400,000. We don't have the money. Please ask your seller if they're prepared to take $200,000 less. My seller is saying, I can't take $200,000 less. I sold back in February and I bought in February. So I paid a premium for what I bought. So now, if that buyer, the first buyer, doesn't buy that $1.2 million home, my seller can't buy the $1.5 million home that she has just bought. If she doesn't buy the $1.5 million home on the day of closing, that seller is going to sue my seller, who is also their buyer. My seller now is going to sue the buyer of her home. But guess what? That buyer is a first time home buyer. All they had was $200,000. They're going to say, I'm insolvent. I'm going to go bankrupt. I have no money to pay you. So now what happens? The $1.5 million seller sues my seller 
who is their buyer and says, hey, you didn't come up with the money to buy my home. I can't come up with the money to buy the next home. So you see this chain reaction and the buck stops at wherever there's equity. So if my seller who sold their $1.2 million home that didn't get their money does not have a mortgage on their home, guess what? Everybody up the line is going to sue all the way down until my seller has to pay up that money. So what I've recommended to sellers is don't dig in your heels at this point. You've got to negotiate. You've got to come up with a solution. And it may not be as simple as I'll take $100,000 less. It may be, I will take $200,000 less, but you still owe me that money over time. I'll give you a second mortgage. So you have to come up with um, creative solutions to combat this problem as opposed to just throwing up your arms and saying, I'm going to sue you. Yeah, on principle, that sounds great, but you can't get blood from a stone. If that buyer at the bottom does not have any equity, they'll just go bankrupt. And you're now dealing with all the aftermath ahead of you with the chain reaction. So negotiating, getting a lawyer involved is so important. And, and really, and it's easier said than done, because even myself as an agent, we, we want to react. We want to be angry at what's going on. And we want to like get upset with everybody. But you know, there has to be a thought process here. And there has to be uh, sort of that ability and that uh, want to come up with a solution and not just say, I'm going to sue everybody. Now that we have the luxury of being able to put conditions uh, back into a deal again, is that going to prevent this from go happening as we go forward? For the most part, it is. I, you know, we've been spoiled for the last three, four years. We've rarely, if ever, seen a condition come in and an offer. Now it's the opposite. It is extremely rare to get an offer without a condition in it. I'm still getting multiple offers on my listings. Four, five, six offers are coming in. Last night, I had seven offers on a property. All but one offer had was cash. So that means six out of the seven offers all had condition. So they all know they're competing, but they're saying, hey, we're willing to lose. The, uh, rather, we'd lose than to take the risk of that home not appraising at the prop price that we're willing to pay you and get stuck. So sometimes it's not bad to have a condition in there because you know that due diligence has been done and there's a bank or somebody that stamped this approval saying we will give you the money. And when you're getting qualified, when you're going to the bank, reach out to banks and ensure that you have a firm approval. A pre-approval is not worth the paper it's written on. Everyone's going to give you a pre-approval. Have they pulled the credit? Have they verified your information? Have they seen your notice of assessment? Have they seen your T4? Have they looked at your job letter? A pre-approval is me saying, Dave, you know, based on your income, I'm pretty sure I can sell you a house for $800,000. That's a pre-approval. Pulling all the numbers, checking the credit, doing all the paperwork is important. And that's called a firm approval. If you do not have a firm approval in your hands, you do not have an approval. Let's switch gears now. And uh, earlier you were talking about, uh, you know, investors and investing. Is, is it a good time for investors to get back into the market? Absolutely. It is a fantastic time. And unfortunately, it's at the cost of renters. So what we've seen now is a shift in the audience. Instead of buying homes and stopping investors from entering the market by renters willing to pay outrageous rents, 3000 I just rented out a 500 square foot, one bedroom condo for $1,700 per month with no parking. It's unheard of. Previously, the rent on that unit was $1,090. So we, we've increased by almost $600 as a result of the demand being so high. And I can't blame investors. They've been taking very minimal rents for a long, long time. So now's their opportunity to catch up. So if you're an investor who was sitting on the sidelines as a result of every buyer paying outrageous amounts of money to buy a home to live in, 
those buyers are not doing that anymore. So this is your opportunity to enter the market and know that your return on investment is going to be pretty good. You're looking at somewhere around a five to 6% cap rate right now as a result of um, buyers just not being there, interest rates being high. And especially if you're an investor that has cash to put in as opposed to going for financing, between now and the spring, I would suggest is a great time to start looking at investment opportunities. I wouldn't go on a shopping spree. I'd average it out, maybe buy one property in the fall, one in the winter, one early spring, or start putting groups together and syndicating and, and, and look at the opportunities that are out there and buy larger buildings, buy more doors instead of buying one at a time. How has the uh, new federal budget impacted investors? Well, it's impacted new construction for the most part. The federal budget is trying to uh, dissuade investors or buyers from using real estate as an investment tool. So all those folks, and we spoke about this on one of your previous shows, um, these assignments where condo developers were allowing buyers to pay outrageous prices, they're paying future values. And you know, I don't even wanna think about what's gonna happen in two or three years when these condo towers are completed and they're not, those units will not be worth, in my opinion, the money that people have paid for those units. So I think we're gonna have a lot of condo units not closed, a lot of investors or flippers or assigners that are not gonna be able to assign those units. And the reason for that is that the federal budget has now come out and stated as of May 7th of 2022, that if you assign your sale or your purchase to an assignee, you are subject to the entire HST for one, for the purchase price. Number two, you will be taxed as if it was income, not as if it were capital gains. So if you're in a 53% tax bracket, which a lot of the investors are, you better be prepared to cut a check for 53% of your profit, plus cut a check for 13% for the HST. And the assignee must pay HST on their purchase. Again, reach out to your accountant, reach out to your lawyer, and find out what the ramifications are of purchasing a property that you thought you were going to assign. Builders, developers are having trouble giving properties away right now. Homes that had sold back in February and March are back on the market relisted at 30, 40, 50% less on price. And I'm talking new construction. So this is not going to be a smooth road for anyone. And if you bought thinking that you're going to make out like a bandit on these uh, new pre-construction, I was getting three, four calls a day from realtors and buyers every day asking, hey, what new pre-construction projects do you have? It was like everybody, and as I said earlier on in the show, when everybody is jumping into something, you know there's some trouble coming down the, down the road. Well, it's funny that you bring that up because my next question was going to be if builders are still selling out subdivisions and condo buildings. It sounds, a, sounds like a resounding no. It is a resounding no, and I think many of these uh, projects have been put on pause now because the yield is not going to be there. And remember the municipalities haven't, uh, again, despite what uh, relief was being sent to the municipalities, what assistance was being sent to the municipalities to expedite permits. I haven't seen that. I haven't seen any of it happen. In fact, the cost has increased significantly on builders, on developers. Material cost is starting to come down a little bit, but not to the levels that it was pre COVID. So, as a builder, I would not dare enter the marketplace right now and build out on a project, especially when they paid ridiculous prices for price per front foot on lots, 15,000 a front foot. That's a 50 foot lot is $750,000. A 2000 square foot home on that lot would cost approximately $800,000 to build. A 2000 square foot home for $1.5 million cost? I think not. You can buy resale for a million dollars right now. Why are you going to pay two thousand? Why are you going to pay one point five million for a two thousand square foot home from a builder right now? Just because the builder overpaid for their land, or the developer overpaid for the land, and the cost of material went up, and the cost of levies went up, building permit fees have gone up, engineering's gone up. It doesn't make sense. 
there has to be relief to developers. There has to be relief for builders. You can't say from one side of your mouth that there's a housing crisis and we need more housing because we have a 1.5 million housing shortage in Canada. And on the other side, say we're going to increase your fees and make it impossible for you to make a profit as a builder. At 1.5 million on a 2,000 2, square foot home, the builder is just breaking even. They can't sell that for 1.2 million. No one's going to build at a loss. So some plan has to be, you know, to slow down the market, interest rates, this is a forced recession that we're in. To slow down the market, interest rates have been rising and the feds are doing this. What they should be doing is handling the crisis, making it easier for development, creating land, just crown land, put that land into, into use, allow development of that land, make it easier for people to get permits. It's taking six, nine months. Try getting a phone call return from a municipality. Like it's impossible. And you know, folks, stop using COVID as an excuse. The municipal, oh, due to COVID, like, come on. Let's, let's ease up and look at what's reality out there. People have just become complacent and municipalities have no interest in supporting developers right now, despite the verbiage that they're using. My guest is Faisal Zuziwala of Remax Twin City Realty, Canada's top real estate agent. If you still have questions, give them a call at 519-624-5555. But we'll be back with more of Ask the Experts in just a couple of minutes. In the meantime, go online to learn more at homeshack.com. Thanks so much for joining us on Ask the Experts. Back with us on the show today from Remax Twin City Realty, Canada's top real estate broker, Faisal Suzy Wall is with us once again. Get in touch at 519-624-5555, or you can learn more online. Really easy to remember. It's homeshack.com. So Faisal, it doesn't seem that long ago, uh, just a few months ago, there were buyers who were bidding just to buy. Where did all those buyers go? Yeah, it was insane. Like I was saying earlier on the show that buyers were paying to buy a home just for the opportunity to own an, a home. It didn't matter what the home looked like. It didn't matter if the home was falling apart. There were no conditions. There was no thought behind it. It was just a frenzy to purchase the home for the sake of buying a home. So where have all those buyers gone? Unfortunately, or fortunately for those who are investors, they've gone to investment properties and they're renting right now. Instead of buying, they are renting. Is that a good thing? I'm going to argue saying it's not a good thing. And I'll say why it's not a good thing, because it's causing bidding wars, believe it or not, in the rental market. So what, I just finished a project re recently in Hesper where our expectation on what that property would rent for, and there were about 50 townhomes and about 30 of them are rentals. We had expected that we would get somewhere between $22 to $2,300 a month two years ago when this project started. Currently, we are getting $3,000 per month on these units. We are getting people offering us above asking to rent these units. We have people who are offering to pay 12 months rent up front. Essentially, what that means is they probably had down payment saved up to buy a home. And now they've decided, listening to the media, maybe listening to other factors, or maybe they're listening to experts and financial advisors who are giving them this advice. And that may be good advice. I would argue that is bad advice to, to rent and see your money depleted while you pay the investor's mortgage. So we're seeing massive amounts of people going into rental. And, we're, and I know that these people are qualified to buy a home because if they're able to cut a check for $36,000 to rent a home, that's a lot of down payment money. Number two, when I see their credit scores, their credit scores are 750, 780, 820, 840. These are fantastic credit scores to be able to be qualified to purchase a home. So why are you folks out there renting right now? Because people are thinking, oh, well, the market's going down. Rates are going up. Market's going down. But as I said earlier on the show, you're not a cash buyer. You're a payment buyer. That payment will still carry the same home at the higher rate because the value of the home has come down. So instead of tripping over each other and getting caught up in these bidding wars, this is the time 
not to rent, but to go and buy a home so that you are playing the long game. In five years, you're not going to look back and say, oh, I'm so happy I didn't buy a home. You're going to look back and say, I wish I had bought five years ago. But when everybody was exiting, you exited too. What you should have been doing is entering. For my career, I've always done that. I look at what the masses are doing. And when everybody is doing exactly the same thing, that's when my light goes on and says, okay, this is probably a good time to exit or this is not the time to enter because everybody is doing it. And you look at the frenzy that it was and you look at the thought process and the impulsiveness and the lack of decision-making um, and advice. People were just doing what they wanted to do and now they're paying for it. I don't recommend to anyone who has the means, who is qualified, who has the down payment, who has the credit score to go into a rental property today. It's almost, from your description, Faisal, it seems like they're waiting for some magic set of variables to match up before they do get into the housing market. What is it they, they imagine they're, they're waiting for? Everyone's looking for the bottom. When is going to hit rock bottom? But what we're not realizing is that it doesn't matter when it hits the bottom. The bottom, it will continue declining as interest rates start increasing. So if you can lock in at your interest rate today before the next interest rate rise and go out there and negotiate a transaction at a reasonable price because there are not multiple offers. Hey, if you had paid $150,000 over asking or $300,000 over asking when the prices were high, essentially, you probably paid $400,000 more than that home was worth three months ago. So if you're saving $400,000 today, what more do you need to wait for? What bottom is it that you're waiting for? It's not going to continuously go until it hits zero. It's going to maybe decline by another 10%. But that 10% decline is as a result of an interest rate hike. So in the long term, that higher interest rate is going to end up costing you more money. So if you take a rational approach to this and say, I'm not buying and flipping. I'm buying and holding on for five years. So I might as well lock in. Yes, the rates are higher than they were, but the prices are lower than they were. So it still balances out. People are being reactive right now. And when change is occurring, people are choosing to pause. When everybody is pausing, that's the time to enter. Uh, it's uh, I look at the calendar. It's hard to believe we're in the middle of August already. So it is time to start looking at the fall market. W what do you think buyers and sellers should be doing in preparation for the fall? Well, get uh, for, from a buyer's perspe perspective, get an updated uh, uh, qualifying done for your for your approval so that you know exactly what you can afford. You know what your affordability is. Continue saving that down payment. Don't go out there spending all your money on rent or vacations or buying a car because you had your money saved up because you're just going to go back down to zero and you've got to start all over. And by the time you save up the money, you're going to be right back into uh, a bidding war situation. I'll, and I'll talk about that a little bit in a moment. Um, for From a seller's perspective, this is a time that you cannot, and, and David, you probably recall Maybe six months ago, I was saying to sellers, do absolutely nothing to your home. Sell it as is. People will just buy you for the opportunity to buy a home because you're it. So you don't need to, you know, put in the new flooring, the granite and the paint and redo your lawn and paint you and, and change your windows or furnace. Just sell your home as is. Today, opposite advice. You better have something that's outstanding. You better have something that shows well. You better make sure that all of that deferred maintenance, the things that you were not doing, are corrected because we've gone from 11, uh, sorry, 110, 120 homes on the market to 16, 17, 1800 homes on the market. So if your home doesn't show well, if you haven't decluttered, if you haven't deodorized, if you haven't cleaned up the messes, and if you haven't changed the windows and the furnace and the air conditioning and the roof, this is the time that you should be doing that, especially if you're getting ready for the fall market, or even more so if you're getting ready for the spring market next year. I don't expect to see a recovery in values for at least two years. So this is a time to think about what you're doing. But remember, if you're selling your home for less today, you're also going to pay less. 
So the gap, the difference is always going to continue to be. Yes, you would have been very happy getting $300,000 more four months ago, but you would have paid $300,000 more for the house you were going to buy. Again, if you're playing in the long game, it really doesn't matter as long as you're in a like market and you're buying and selling in the same market. If sellers want to spruce up their home to make it more attractive to buyers, then where are they going to get the best bang for their buck? What should they be doing besides the basics like cleaning up and deodorizing and that sort of thing? You know, kitchens are very important. Bathrooms are very important. Flooring is important. Cosmetic, just just that, just that feel. You need to, and, and having it decluttered, you know, a, a large part of, of, of selling a home is being able to show the space. If your home is full of clutter and you're tripping over things cutting through that house, you know, that's not going to put people in the right mindset. So have it organized, have it decluttered. That, if that means putting all your stuff in the garage, then that's what you do or putting it in the unfinished area of your basement. That's what you do. Ideally, you get it out of your house completely. But kitchens, bathrooms, that's always been the number one, number two um, selling feature of a home. And then just making sure that the colors are bright and you're not having anything dramatic, neutralize the house. So it doesn't, you know, yes, we all like specific tastes and we all have specific tastes, but when you're selling your home, you want to make it as neutral and as a, a blank canvas almost for somebody to come in and put their touches in. My guest on Ask the Experts this hour, we're speaking with Faisal Susie Walla, Canada's top real estate agent with REMAX Twin City Realty. Get more advice by calling 519-624-5555 or look him up online. It's easy to remember. You'll find Faisal's website at homeshack.com. Thanks so much for joining us on Ask the Experts. Faisal Susie Walla is my guest. Faisal is Canada's top real estate agent. REMAX Twin City Realty, online at homeshack.com and give him a call at 519-624-5555. Six two four fifty five fifty five. Since we were just talking about builders and building homes, Faisal, if you are building a home, what are your recommendations for the sort of upgrades we should put into a home? What are we going to get a really good return on investment with? Well, we have to be mindful today that you know today's needs are changing. Multi generational homes are very important to find a home that has the ability to maybe have an in-law suite, a side entrance into the basement, or maybe an entrance from the garage into the basement, putting egress windows. So what I mean by that is larger windows in the basement that meet the code. So these are all things that can be done fairly inexpensively in the beginning, as opposed to you purchasing a home and then having to cut out the window and make it bigger or put in a staircase afterwards. So while the foundation is being poured, think about the future, what the home may need or what the needs may be. So that's going to be more important, in my opinion, than doing an all brick home, for example. Whether your home is all brick or whether your home is uh, half siding, half brick, that's not going to give you a return on investment. But what will give you the return on investment is put in the rough-in bathroom in the basement. So you don't have to put in the bathroom fixtures, but get the rough-ins done. Because putting all that stuff in, putting in the big windows, putting in the walkout, putting in the door, putting in the access to the basement, that's all important. Put in the higher ceilings on the main floor at least. So instead of eight foot, opt into the nine foot because that gives you the opportunity to have the taller cabinetry in the, in the kitchen as well. Um, go for the open floor plans as opposed to boxed in rooms and that type of thing. If you have the ability to have a main floor bedroom with an, in, with an ensuite, then that's something you should consider because we have to look at the demographics. We have an aging population. If you're purchasing a home today, don't buy it for today, buy it for the future. You may be in that home 15 or 20 years. Uh, your kids may be young right now. And at some point they're gonna move out. You don't wanna be in a position where you have to sell that home because you can't get up and down the stairs. So put in a master bedroom or a primary bedroom, I should say, on the main floor with an ensuite, which can be used as a guest room for now. It can be used as an office for now, but it will be uh, converted to a, to a main floor primary suite when you need it when you're older. So these are all important things. So don't get caught up on the luxury features of a home. Put the money towards structural, put the money towards things that you can't really add later on. Um, that hard hardwood staircase, better to do it now than have to retrofit it later on. 
um, gas lines for barbie, uh, sort of for barbecue or for fireplace. These are all things that you can you can add now, especially venting for a fireplace. It's, it's more difficult to do later on. So if you can get the venting done ahead of time, then you don't have to worry about going through walls and whatnot and trying to do that later on. So think about the things that are structural and get to that ahead of time. And don't spend too much of your budget on cosmetics like granite. Those are all things you can do later on. Some good advice there. Thanks, Faisal. Uh, let's finish up the show today by uh, mentioning the book again. I have my copy here of The Real Deal, Billion Dollar Real Estate Broker by Faisal, available on Amazon as a physical book and also as an audio book. There's a couple of chapters that we've touched on before, and they're still very important to talk about. Let's start with the chapter on investment. What are people going to learn from that chapter? Today, now, more than ever, and the opportunities are now back to becoming an investor or building your wealth portfolio. And I speak extensively, extensively on that in my book because it's important to me. Real estate is a long term opportunity to build wealth and buying a home and selling it buying a home and flipping it is not really a constructive way of building wealth what one should be doing is buying a home putting 20 percent down letting the value increase and in the last few years we've been very lucky values have gone up i've mentioned earlier up to 60 percent in the last few years so that's the time to take some equity out of that property and reinvest it into another home. Let that build up, take some equity out again and reinvest. So basically rinse and repeat. Continuously doing that every few years, putting 20% down on the next home, renting it out. That's where you're going to start creating wealth. You're gonna create um, a portfolio that A, will allow you to retire with passive income that will most likely replace your day-to-day -day income and also give you an opportunity to leave something behind for your children or your loved ones. And that's where, you know, that's where the goal is for most investors today is to build something up so that they can have something that they can pass on to their family. Or even if it's something as simple as you've got one or two kids, buy a property and trust for them so that when they're of age, that will help them get a start in life, pay for their education, pay for their weddings, whatever they need to do, pay for the down payment of their first home. But it's something that you've got to start doing now in order to facilitate this for the future, because the young people today are not going to have the opportunities given the high cost of living and unfortunately their spending habits. So we as parents, and, and even if you're not a parent, if you're a young person today, it doesn't mean that you need to, to move out of mom and dad's house and um, buy a home to live in. Live in mom and dad's house. Live in the basement for the next 10 years if you have to, but get your money into an investment property that could essentially become your next home or it could become the home that you sell later on to buy the first home that you want to live in. Some great advice as usual. Faisal, thank you so much for being on the show once again. My pleasure. Thank you for having me on, David. Faisal Walla is Canada's top real estate broker with Remax Twin City Realty. Find the book on Amazon.com or actually Amazon.ca, The Real Deal, and get more answers. Give him a call at 519 at 624-5555 or go online, homeshack.com.